Nearly 40 years ago, an offhand remark in a Sunday sermon launched Scott Hahn on an intellectual quest that would change his life and the life of his family. What was that quest and what answers did he find? Today, we'll discuss those questions and more with Dr. Scott Hahn, professor of theology here at Franciscan and author of the new book, The Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross. I'm Dr. Bob Rice, professor of catechetics at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Rice, a catechetics professor here at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are talking about the fourth cup, unveiling the mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross. I'm joined by our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and guest panelist, Dr. William Newton, professor of theology here at Franciscan University. And we're pleased to welcome to the guest chair, Dr. Scott Hahn. Dr. Hahn holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization at Franciscan University. He is the founder and president of the St. Paul Center, a popular speaker. He is a best-selling author of dozens of books, including one of his most recent, The Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross. Uh, Scott, it's great that you're here. Thanks. We're all big fans of yours, uh, and uh, we appreciate you making time to come down here. <laughs> hey, tell us about, um, why don't we just introduce the idea. Uh, what is the fourth cup? Well, the fourth cup refers to the, uh, the fourfold structure of the Jewish Passover mm. as it was celebrated in the first century, and as it's still celebrated in the 21st century by Orthodox Jews. It was something unknown to me. It was something I discovered uh, as part of my own personal research. I was feeling like a detective one semester at the end of my seminary career. I had just come back from a, uh, a Palm Sunday service where my favorite preacher had delivered a wonderful sermon on the Passion Narrative. Mm. And when he got to John 18, John 19 verses 28 to 30, he, uh, he was covering very familiar ground where Jesus, seeing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst, and there was a, a bowl full of sour wine there with a hyssop branch, and they lift it to his lips, and he drinks, and when he drank it, he said, it is finished. Hmm. And the, the preacher asked a rhetorical question that we all thought he was prepared to answer, and that is, what is finished? What is it? What is Jesus talking about? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's that's not hard. I mean, it's our redemption. It's the work of our redemption. That's what's finished. And he must have been reading my mind because he said, well, if you think it's Jesus' redemptive work, think again, because in Romans 4.25, he was raised for our justification. And since he's not resurrected yet, it's not finished yet. Mm. So it must yeah. be something else. But what it is, I don't know. And so he went back to his sermon notes. And I didn't. I, <laughs> I was just like grabbing hold of, you can't ask a question you're not ready to answer, especially a good one like that. And so I spent literally the rest of the day when I got back to my apartment with Kimberly. And when, anyway, this was years ago. This right? is when I was a, uh, my last year at seminary in 1982. So before you came into the church? That's or? right, in 86 I came into the church. And so right before graduation and right before ordination as a Presbyterian pastor, I went on a, it felt like Columbo, hmm. the detective, you know, <laughs> Peter Falk played. Because I'm looking for clues to answer a question that I thought was a self-evident one when I first heard it. And I began to realize that, wait a second, you know, you gotta look at that in context. Jesus' crucifixion is taking place at the time of the Passover. So I went back to Exodus 12 to study the first Passover, which I pretty well knew, but I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the first century Passover the way the Jews would have celebrated in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples and all the other pilgrims in Jerusalem. And that's where I discovered through the writings of a rabbi, uh, a professor at Oxford, David Dobb, wrote a book called The New Testament and Rabbinic Judaism. So he's looking at the New Testament through the eyes of a rabbi and seeing all kinds of things that Christians wouldn't see. Hmm. You know? And the one thing he showed me was uh, 
that when you back up from the cross to the upper room, from Good Friday to Holy Thursday, as it were, you can see that there are multiple cups that are being used in the Last Supper. Luke 22 refers to those. You can also tell that the cup that Jesus consecrates for the Eucharist is the cup of blessing, from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing, the cup which we bless, the cup of <laughs> blessing is a participation in the, the blood of Christ. And so Dobb points out, as a rabbi, that he's consecrating the third cup, and then he announces that he's not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until he drinks it new with them in the kingdom. And then they sing the hymn, the great Hallel, mm -hmm. and then they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And nothing seems out of the ordinary to Gentile Christian readers, but to a rabbi, they shared the third cup, which he consecrated. They sang the great Hallel, but they never had the fourth cup, the Hallel cup, which is the climax of the Passover liturgy. It would be like inviting a Jew to a mass, and he would notice if your priest somewhat oddly forgot the words of consecration or omitted the rite of communion. But of course, every Catholic would sure. notice. And so I'm looking at it through a rabbi's eyes, and I'm realizing, wait a second, you know, he skipped the fourth cup. Why? You know, well, maybe he was just too bothered about all of the tragic events that he knew were about to unfold, but he seemed to be very much in control of himself, and he also seemed to express himself so clearly, I am not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. You know, it, it sounds as though he's warning them that I'm not going to drink what you are expecting me to drink. Right. And so it raised the question, and then I pursued it further simply by following him out to the Mount of Olives where he falls on his face and prays three times, take this cup, Father. Mm -hmm. And then again, Abba, Father, take this cup. And you know, I always thought that that was some kind of vague allusion to the prophets Isaiah or Jeremiah, but I began to realize that no, again, for Jewish readers like Rabbi Dob, this, is mu this must be somehow connected to you know, the, the four cups, three of which they drank, the fourth they didn't, the third he consecrates, and so he's celebrating the Passover one last time, but he's, he's fulfilling it as the Lamb of God by transforming the old into the new, and that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And so when you see you know, the, the soldiers arrive, Peter draws the sword, and Jesus says a fourth time there in the garden, shall I not drink the cup which the Father has for me? He's got cup on the mind, you know? <laughs> right. and, and, when so, I read, and when I read your book, um, as you're talking about it, it seems so obvious. You know, right. like, I mean, once, you, once you start highlighting it, I don't think it did to anybody. I mean, no. I think this was really... But did the church fathers? I mean, they were obviously much more connected to the Jewish roots than we are. So you, you, there's obviously a Jewish scholar of modern times uh, in, in Oxford who kind of was honing in on that. Did the church fathers have some sort of insight in that? Level? You know, Melito of Sardis in Peri Pasca is the master of the Passover typology, but he doesn't actually show any trace of awareness of the traditional Jewish practice of the Seder, of the Passover liturgy, which includes the meal, but it's mm -hmm. a sacrificial communion. I mean, in a certain sense, with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD, and the, you know, everything is post-Temple Judaism. Mm -hmm. So you move from the temple to synagogues, you move from a chief priest to rabbis, you move from a sacrifice to scrolls, mm -hmm. you move from you know, a sacrifice to sermons. And mm -hmm. so by the time you get to the second, third, and fourth centuries, the patristic sources don't show really hardly yeah. any awareness of the traditional form of the Passover as Jesus explained. Well, is, that, is that partly because um, the Passover that you read in the scripture doesn't have the cups, no. and, and, it, or, and it develops That's later exactly in the Jewish right. tradition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the Passover in Exodus 12 is a domestic liturgy. You're, you're celebrating it in Egypt while you're still enslaved en route to freedom. Right. But by the time you get out and get settled in the land, the liturgy is obviously going to change from your own family dwellings to the temple, right. from fathers and their firstborns to the chief priests and the Levites. Mm. And so the adaptation of the original liturgy is precisely what fascinated me much more than it fascinated the fathers because they were focusing almost exclusively on the biblical typology. And well, so you're, I mean, you're sort of crystallizing everything in the space of about five minutes, <laughs> yeah. but it <laughs> really right. took a long time. Uh, I mean, let's revisit the chronology. 1982, you hear the sermon that right. baffles you, and then four years later, you become a Catholic. Right. Something happened en route to that Damascus. And what was it? What, how did you marinate this question? Well, you know, you, you're pointing out the obvious question because, you know, looking back in hindsight, I realized that the answer was hiding 
in plain uh -huh. view. Yeah. But you know, I had overlooked it like practically everybody else had. And you know, the first thing I had to overcome was the bias of historical critical scholarship that simply dissociates the Last Supper from the Passover. The majority of biblical scholars in the 20th century would say, no, there is no Passover. You know, uh -huh. that's just something that the evangelists are kind of superimposing yeah. upon whatever they were doing in the Last Supper. And then along comes a German scholar, Joachim Jeremias, mm -hmm. who writes the Eucharistic words of Jesus as a historical critic, one of the greatest in the world, and he overturns that settled conclusion by showing, no, the evidence actually points in favor of it being what the gospel writers say. So I got over the first hurdle. It is a Passover, like the Catechism right. states in 1340. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the Passover in Exodus 12, I'm realizing, okay, but it's different in the upper room. There are multiple cups that aren't mentioned in Exodus 12. Where do the cups come from? Rabbi Dobb nails it. And I found others too, right. but he was the clearest. And he was the one who, who pointed out the omission of the fourth cup as he called this one section of his book. That was the, the subheading. I'm like, yeah. the omission of the fourth cup? Huh. Yeah. And, but he, and he also connects it to the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. But like others, he just says, well, this must be, this must, the fourth cup must be what Jesus plans to drink at the end of time. Right. Because he's not going to taste of the fruit of the vine. And sure enough, you know, when they offer him the wine mingled with myrrh up the Via Della Rosa, right. he refuses yeah. it. You know, and all four evangelists point out that they're offering him sour wine. Uh, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't tell us whether he drank. And if all we had to go on were the three Gospels, the synoptics, right. yeah. we'd probably say he, yeah. he probably didn't because he said he wouldn't. Right. But John is the only eyewitness. And John doesn't just tell us whether he drank or not. He emphasizes Jesus knowing that all was finished. He said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And it struck me, well, that guy had been suffering from pain and hunger right. and thirst for hours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why moments before he's dead right. is he saying, I thirst? Well, to fulfill the scripture. Right. and. When John says, when he drank of the sour wine, he said, tell, tell us, die. It is finished. And then John goes on to notice that he dies. They break the bones, the legs of the thieves, but not Jesus because he's right. already dead. Thus to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of his shall be broken. Only John, the, eye, the right. only eyewitness. And only in John 19 do you have Exodus 12, 46 that you couldn't offer as a Passover sacrifice, a gimpy or crippled lamb, right, right. you know? That's, and yeah. so, you know, all of these things converged like spokes on the hub of a wheel, right. which was Christ. But <laughs> at the same time, I had to say, you know, uh, these clues are out there. And, right. you know, I gathered them together and I was really proud of myself. Oh, yeah. wow, you know, you found the answer. And then I began to realize that the implications of the answer were already embedded in the Catholic tradition right. of the Eucharist and the Catholic Mass. Yeah, yeah. And so, like you said, the chronology, it, it took over a year uh -huh. when I look back on all my notes in my journals. But by the time I had really assimilated it, it, took, it was two years, and by then I was being intractably drawn to the Mass, to yeah. Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. Well, you know, Columbo, he cracks the case in about uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> right. but, I mean, you're more than Columbo. I mean, not just because you don't wear a trench coat, <laughs> but you're, in, you're impassioned. Uh, about this. I mean, this is, this is not just an intellectual exercise. This is of a peace with a pilgrimage. I mean, you're on a journey. You're trying to find the truth, and you're fired with a certain uh, uh, poverty of spirit. You want to know what really happened. What does right. it mean? And, and, and I would also say this, that it was exciting. It was emboldening, you know, and it, it, it certainly puffed up my head more than a little. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when you finally get to the end, you realize that you weren't just following clues like Columbo on an old detective show. You were picking up crumbs on a trail that were deliberately left right. for you yeah. to find, yeah. to trace it yeah. to the master who right. gave me a right. gift yeah. that I had been taking credit for all along until I found it. Then I realized this is pure grace. Amen. And that <laughs> yeah. was 40 years ago. So uh, you ish. just, yeah, <laughs> so right. So there's a, a, a book that you just came out with, and certainly since that time, um, you've continued to dive deeper into this mystery. Right, I mean, I've given this talk probably uh, close to 100 times and close to 100 ways. It always comes out differently because yeah. I had never written it up. Well, I wrote it up as chapter 12 and the Father Keeps His mm -hmm. Promises back in the 90s. And Brant Petrie kind of adapted it in his book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist as well, that I was privileged to write a forward to. Uh, and a number of other scholars have critiqued it and advanced it and strengthened it and that sort of thing. 
But you know, when my publisher asked me, can we put out the book? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but whenever I work on a book, I always draw from my talks that I've given many times and the transcripts. And I'm like, I have more transcripts to draw from for this <laughs> one. You know, this could be right. this yeah. could be a big, big book, you know. Yeah. And so when I went through the talk and all the transcripts and this sort of thing, it came together. It mm, was really, yeah. it was kind of exciting to bring closure on a process that had not only enveloped me for over a year, but has also and seemed to enchant a lot of other people along mm. the way. I, I, I remember going back to when I was a assistant to the president of Grove City College, I was still working at two Presbyterian churches. I knew I was headed either Anglican, Orthodox, or Catholic, I just didn't know which. But I was sharing this with a number of my college kids, the better ones who were theology majors. And you know, one of them was an ex-Catholic, and you know, he was the one, like a laser beam, you're like, you know, can't you see where this is leading? And I'm like, no. You know, and all of them but him have come into the church. Hmm. You know, so it seemed to help me a lot, and it seems to help a lot of other people a lot. And so I'm grateful to our Lord for the privilege of writing it up. Well, praise God. Well, we have so much more to talk about, so stay with us as Franciscan University Presents continues. Just as Jesus' sacrifice doesn't begin on Calvary, but the Calvary sacrifice begins in the upper room during Passover, so the Passover doesn't end when they leave the upper room. The Passover doesn't end until Jesus receives the wine on the cross. That is the consummation of the Passover, and that is the point at which Jesus finishes the transformation of the Old Covenant Passover into the New Covenant Passover that we call the Eucharist. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His Church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself in an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about the fourth cup with our guest, Dr. Scott Hahn. Um, Scott, so much of understanding the fourth cup, as we talked about in the earlier segment, is understanding the Passover meal and the Seder meal. Right. Um, for many of our audience who might not be have any real familiarity with what that looks like, uh, what is the benefit of a deeper understanding of that or even potentially celebrating that uh, for a Catholic today? Yeah, I mean, there are three stages here. The original Passover in Exodus 12, the Jewish Seder meal, as well as the Eucharist. So we'll take the first two. You know, in Exodus 12, the ritual prescribed by our Lord through Moses for all of Israel is rather simple. You, you take a lamb, a male lamb, unblemished with no broken bones, and you, you slaughter the lamb. And then you take a hyssop branch and you sprinkle the blood on the doorpost. Then you roast the lamb and you gather as a family around the table and you eat that roasted lamb. And you do so standing up with staff in hand, your loins girded, ready to flee to freedom under the leadership of Moses and the guidance of the Spirit. Um, but it's really important to slaughter the lamb, to sprinkle the blood, and to eat the lamb. Mm. The eating of the lamb is not because lamb is everybody's favorite dish, it's the climax of the sacrifice, which is the communion. <laughs> so it really wasn't an option. If you took a vote and you said, well, we're not gonna eat the lamb, your firstborn would be dead by morning. You know? mm. So you had to eat the lamb, and that's the climax of the Passover. And I think that also really has an application that the fathers saw that if Jesus is the Lamb of God, it's not enough just to celebrate it one last time. It's not enough just to kind of die. There really is a sense in which he has to make provisions in the Eucharist so that we can commune upon the sacrificial lamb. And I think that's what Exodus 12 really helps us with. Sure. Uh, the Seder meal itself, the way it was celebrated in the first or the 21st century, you know, as I mentioned, the fourfold structure, the four cups, you have the, the first cup is called the Kedush, which is the Hebrew word for consecration, because it's basically a blessing for the whole meal, the festival. And you know, you, you share some bitter herbs to remind yourselves about the bitterness of slavery. And then you move to the second stage, almost 
immediately. The Haggadah cup is uh, based upon the Haggadah, which is the recitation of the Passover narrative in Exodus 12, typically in interrogative form. So the youngest member asks the questions that the oldest member answers. Right. And it might have been the beloved disciple reclining on Jesus' breast, and then Jesus responding to his youngest disciple's questions. And when the Haggadah cup is shared, then you move into the main course. And that's where the lamb is served and some more bitter herbs. And this is where the third cup, you know, and, the, and this is the Barakah cup, the Barakah stage of the Passover, because that's the word for blessing. It's the cup of blessing. Hmm. So when Paul speaks of the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? He's talking about the Eucharist, but he's talking as a Jewish Christian because he wouldn't know to call it that unless he had experienced a Passover every year throughout his entire life as a Jew. Hmm. And so clearly in Luke 22, the third cup is the cup that he consecrates as the Eucharistic cup of blessing. And Luke also refers to a previous cup. So you know that there are multiple cups that are being shared in the upper room. And then you also have then the Hallel sung, and then the fourth cup is called the Hallel cup, because the great praise, which is Psalms 114 through 118, climax with the consumption, the shared communion of the fourth cup. Hmm. And that's what skipped. Now, how did we go from Passover to Seder? I mean, at least in the history of the Jewish people, where did we see uh, the celebration of these cups begin? Well, there are at least two tributaries that make for this new river because, as I said, in Egypt, it was a domestic liturgy. Right. The Levites hadn't even become clergy yet. You know, and so when you're now in the Promised Land, there are two stages. On the one hand, it is now a Levitical ritual celebrated in the temple mm -hmm. by the priests. It's no longer a domestic liturgy celebrated by the fathers and the firstborn sons. And yet, the second tributary is the fact that you still do something as a family, even if it's not going to the altar like a Levite, like Aaron the high priest and sacrificing the lamb. And so the Passover Seder is inseparable from the Passover sacrifice. Mm. And there's no rule book that exactly explains these things, but you know that the Seder is also a tributary to what we would see as the Passover of the New Covenant, the Christian Passover, we call the Eucharist because of the cups. Yeah. You know. I, it I would think be the situation that because um, when the Jews entered the, uh, sorry, when, when, the, when the temple was destroyed and there was no longer the possibility of sacrifices, then actually the, the Seder became much more a meal and was somewhat divorced from the idea of, sa of sacrifice. Uh, and in a certain sense, the Catholic uh, position is going to be that if the Last Supper is somehow the sort of prototype of the Mass, the fourth cup makes the connection with the sacrifice. We understand therefore the Mass to be both sacrifice and meal. Whereas maybe from the Protestant tradition, if there's more of a focus uh, on, the, meal. on the meal, exclusively, it's somehow because the, the Jewish connection had lost itself and that is somehow filtered in, or is that pushing things too far? No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not an easy one. You know, I would say the first part of your question points to uh, not only the diaspora Judaism, which comes after 70 AD, but as you mentioned, with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple back in 587, you have now diaspora Judaism. You don't have a temple with an altar and a high priest offering Passover lambs. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that it is reduced to nothing more than a meal. Uh, at Elephantine, the colony in, 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 in Egypt, we also know that at Mount Carmel, Elijah sacrifices uh, apart from the Jerusalem temple. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we find out that there are strands within Judaism that allowed for a lamb to be slaughtered in a semi-sacrificial way, even if you didn't have a temple with an altar and a Levitical high priest standing there. And so these adaptations you know, are not always chronicled with precision, but you get a sense that the Passover, even in the dispersion, never becomes exclusively a meal. Mm -hmm. It's always a sacrifice, too, because there's a lamb. You know, and so yeah, it, it seems to me that the, the question that's probably lurking uh, in in this otherwise very learned discussion is: Is it okay for Catholics to observe this custom to do the Seder meal so that they can uh, you know strut their ecumenical uh, sinews uh, and remind the Jews that we're all Semites? I mean, is that good question? I mean, is that plausible? It's sort of like on the one hand and on the other. You know, on the one hand, I've done this over the years and I've learned from it. On the other hand, not only from patristic sources do you have strong warnings against that, 
but also with rather ecumenical sensitivities, you wouldn't want some post-Catholic group to kind of celebrate their version of the Eucharist right. without the words of consecration yeah. or what have you, you know? And so out of sensitivity to Orthodox Jews, as well as out of, of kind of faithfulness to the, the, the testimony of the early church fathers, uh, Chrysostom has a discourse against the Judaizing Christians. Yeah. Because a Seder can often sort of blur the lines right. and yeah. uh, attract people to Judaize in ways that the early church fathers had a clear sense that no, these things are the mass. Right, you know, it, it, it's a, a species of, of what we call syncretism, which yeah. we, we want always, I think, to uh, avoid, uh, deplore. Uh, you know, nowadays we have that phrase, cultural misappropriation. Uh, and, and one thinks of, for example, Senator Warren uh, telling us that she's really a Cherokee. I mean, Pocahontas, that, that whole business is really phony. Uh, and the Jews, they didn't really well, Christianity views Judaism as a foreshadowing of something far better. And, and so we ought not to return to that because the whole orientation of Judaism is in the direction of a fulfillment which is precisely enfleshed in Jesus the Christ. So That's right. I mean, if Christ is the Lamb, then the Passover lamb isn't more lamb-like than Jesus. Yeah. It's a foreshadowing. Right. Once we see the reality in Christ, we understand how it casts the shadows back into the Old Testament right. and why the lambs that are irrational animals merely foreshadow. Right. So to return to that after right. the reality right. is kind of like going back into the cave of Plato and looking at the shadows right. instead of the right. reality that's, that are that's casting. Exactly. Some of the typology you mentioned in the book is, is quite astounding. It's, uh, I didn't know this point. Um, you say that uh, when the when the lamb was sacrificed, often it was actually using stakes which were put into a cruciform uh, sort of structure. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, those kind of things, it's like, uh, it's not that Jesus is sort of thinking, well, I know that's what they do, so I'm going to sort of play the part. Those things in divine providence, are, uh, the Spirit's been leading those people to do those precisely to make Jesus, uh, you might say, their motives of credibility for the Jews. Right. Hey, They're look, good. this exactly one is completely right. fulfilling motives it. Motives of credibility from Vatican I is exactly what these provide. You know, and back in the 19th century, besides Vatican I, we have this famous Jewish convert, Alfred Edersheim, who writes a book on the mm -hmm. temple and some other books as well. He's a Protestant, but Catholics have found him very useful, especially my good friend, Dr. Brant Petrie. And he's the one who draws from the Mishnah and the Talmud and these other sources that show us the process that in effect the lamb was really stretched to cruciform in order to be slaughtered. And when you look at what Edersheim described from the Jewish sources in terms of the blood and the water that flowed right. out, you yeah. know, then you realize that the blood and the water that flows from the pierced side of Jesus is so temple-like that again, Jews steeped in this would see similarities right, and convergences right. and parallels mm -hmm. that every well, Gentile you, you Christian would Well, you provide a pretty astonishing example, the image, the symbolism of the entrails of the freshly slain sheep wrapped in a kind of helmet uh, and placed, uh, uh, you know, at the top of this whole affair. And that reminds us exactly of the crown of thorns right. wrapping themselves about the head of Jesus. I mean, the parallel is unmistakable. It's uncanny. Yeah, I, I think we've got to be careful of what Samuel Sandmel once called parallel mania. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think these parallels are salient. But I think the canonical parallels that the fathers privileged are more so. Yeah. In other words, when you do this historical work as I have done, and you find from Edersheim and from the Mishnah and the Talmud uh, non-canonical uh, descriptions of Jewish customs, I think these have got to be backgrounded. And uh -huh. the biblical yeah. material is what I try to foreground. Yeah. So there's a privileging of the canonical sure. inspired details. Yeah. And at the same time, there's recourse to the background, you know. Right. But I, I think that there's a danger of a kind of titillation or a fascination, like I'm fixating on all of these historical things that are really nice, you know, but they're questionable. I, I think that they're very probable, but I, I don't think they're, they're, you're never going to add up to more than motives of credibility when you see these parallels. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think you have the certitude of faith when you see the inspired narrative of the old covenant Passover, and then you see the inspired narrative of the institution right. narratives. Yeah. That is yeah. No, no, that I think yeah, this, this, the search for 
symbols can can be uh, almost demented. Right. I mean, Flannery O'Connor has a great line about the critics who strain the soup too thin, <laughs> looking for this or that uh, allegory. Uh, and and it, it's there, there's not a whole lot of future in that. But Justin Martyr, I, I think, does oh, yeah. seize upon that example of the entrails, and it right. does unmistakably remind us of a crown of thorns. And in the book of, of uh, Revelations, as you yourself point out, 28 discrete references uh, to Christ as the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if this is what happens to the Lamb when, when it's been slaughtered by the Jews, then it invites that application to Jesus when He's being slaughtered, this That's bloody right. Roman execution. Because, right. I mean, you, we pointed out previously that the sort of great admission that somebody would note if they're a Jew is that the fourth cup, but the other great admission is that there wasn't a Lamb at the, right. at the Last Supper, yeah? Precisely because Christ well, there was the lamb. lamb. Yeah, the right. lamb. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they are the two greater, uh, I assume from the Jewish point of view, if you're looking at the story from Jewish eyes, you're like, there's two things that really are missing here. Yeah. Well, last cup, <laughs> where's the lamb? Well, you know, th there is a scholarly debate as to whether there was or wasn't. I kind of lean towards there wasn't because there's no bitter herbs that are mentioned, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of other little details that are sort of omitted. Mm -hmm. I would think the presence of Judas would be the bitter herb. Uh, that Jesus mm. had to somehow uh, uh, assimilate. Well, you're straining the soup and you're allegorizing. <laughs> <laughs> but it does lead us, I think, to the idea of uh, what was the sacrifice uh, that was done at that Last Supper, which we're going to see fulfilled on the cross. And that that's is exact, the key. That's the key, and that's what we're yep. going to talk about when we get back. Uh, please stay with us at Franciscan University Presents. The reason why God orders animal sacrifice is to bring about a communion meal to signify our family unity with Him. So when the Passover lamb is slaughtered and His blood is sprinkled, something ultimate still remains, and that is eating the lamb. You had to eat the lamb. If you didn't, it wouldn't take. So Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. He is slain. His blood is shed, but something remains for us to do. Our lamb is slaughtered, his blood is sprinkled, but we have to eat the lamb. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we're coming to you from the Communication Arts Studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment, and my colleagues in the Theology Department, Dr. Regis Martin, Dr. William Newton, and Dr. Scott Hahn, we're all talking about Scott's book, The Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross. Um, let's get into the heart of it. Where was the lamb? Where was the sacrifice? We didn't see it happening at the Last Supper as you normally would at a Seder meal. And really the heart of uh, what you're talking about in the book is understanding uh, Christ as a sacrifice. That's right. Just talk more about that because that I yeah. think is really the, the, the key, you know, the mind-blowing moment when I was reading this of just, what? Right. I mean, the takeaway for me and I think for all of us is the fact that you know the Passover as the background is the key that illuminates the crucifixion. Uh, we're so accustomed to seeing Jesus dying at Calvary on Good Friday as a sacrifice. It's important to kind of recognize that if we had been there on Good Friday standing at Calvary as devout Jews, as devout disciples who had followed our Lord for the last two or three years, not one of us could have been able to express our experience in terms of a sacrifice, hmm. because for Jews a sacrifice had to take place in the Jerusalem temple on top of an altar with the high priest and the Levitical clergy there to preside, and he's crucified outside the walls far from the temple where there were no altars with Levitical clergy standing by to preside at the liturgy. So what we would have witnessed and what we would have recounted later that day to our friends and family members would not have been a sacrifice. It would have been a Roman execution and a really brutal, bloody execution at that. And so the question became for me, how did a Roman execution get turned into not only a sacrifice, but one so holy that it retires all of the animals that are offered in the Jerusalem temple? Mm 
Mm. And the only way you can find an answer to that question is the Passover. And that's exactly what Paul provided me and the early fathers in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 when he says, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, mm. therefore let us keep the feast. And the feast that he goes on to explain in the subsequent chapters is what we call the Eucharist. And so he's connecting Thursday and Friday, the upper room and Calvary, because you can't understand either one without the other. If all you had was the upper room, all you'd think you had, well, were witnessing was a Jewish Passover. You know, there were some aberrations, you know, Jesus is doing something with the unleavened bread that the disciples had never seen or heard before. Take this and eat of it. This is my body, which was given up, which is, will be given up for you. I mean, they must have wanted to interrupt him and ask, what, what was that? You know, but he's back on track, and so we'll let him go. But then at the end, when he's taking the cup of, of blessing, the third cup, and he's, he's consecrating with words that we've grown up with all of our lives that none of the Jews there would have ever heard before, they must have been baffled. You know, you don't just improvise in the middle of this sacred liturgy, and yet here he is saying things and doing things that might have struck them as rhetoric or ritual, but then suddenly the reality is what's dawning on them the next day at Good Friday, where at the Calvary, you're like, that is his body, and it is given up. And he said what he meant, he meant what he said, and that's the blood that's being poured out. And so the Passover wasn't just celebrated one last time, it was fulfilled by the true lamb, yeah. And he fulfilled the Passover by transforming the old into the new. And the Passover in the old was never just a meal, it was always a sacrifice. The meal was simply a sacrificial communion. And if that's true in the old, it's not less but more true in the new, where the Lamb of God has laid down his body and life for us out of love. And so he's made provisions for a meal, but that's a sacrificial communion. And once again, all of these you know, all of the dominoes started to fall for me. It was like, you know, for us as Protestants, the idea that the Mass is a sacrifice is the most horrendous blasphemy. It is a meal. And for Catholics, it is a meal. It's the Last Supper. It's the mm -hmm. Lord's Supper. But it's not just a meal or primarily a meal. It's primarily a sacrifice. The meal is secondarily a sacrificial communion. And all of a sudden, the Catholic Church's teachings not only struck me as plausible, but as the only coherent account of the details, so you know, if, if, if this is just a meal, then that's just an execution. But if this is the Passover of the New Covenant, it can't be just a meal, it had to be a sacrifice, and that's what illuminates the mystery of Calvary. Yeah. He's not losing his life as a victim of Roman violence, he's giving his life as a victim of divine love. And so Eucharist transforms an execution into a sacrifice, just as Easter Sunday transforms the sacrifice into the sacrament, mm. which we do in remembrance of him because his body isn't in the upper room anymore. It's not hanging and bleeding on the cross. It's not buried in the tomb. He's raised from the dead. He's ascended on high. He's the high priest in heaven who comes in the power of the Spirit in the sacrifice of the Mass. Whether I knew it or not, whether I accepted it or I condemned it, it's just like, Holy grace. You know, right. you know, <laughs> this uh, this um, idea of, 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 of the temple uh, is, is, uh, is uh, an intriguing one. It, it strikes me that in, in Jewish usage, if you're going to have a sacrifice, it's got to take place inside the temple. But Jesus is the new temple. He right. breaks that precedent. He blows it wide open, pulverizes that. And likewise, who's there to witness this at the foot of the cross? Mary, his mother, who was there at the end and was there at the beginning when the announcement was made to her uh, in her home in Nazareth. That wasn't a temple either. Unlike Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, his birth is announced in a temple uh, to a functioning official of the temple, Zechariah. Mary is this no-account woman, a woman of all things, in this jerkwater town, Nazareth, and it all begins right there. There's the alpha point, and it leads to the omega, where the temple is once again renewed, sacrificed, in the person of Jesus, whose body is broken to become food for the world. That's right. And yeah. He can do this. Right. And, and you, you make an interesting um, uh, exploration of the timing of the Last Supper, and you, you're in favor of, of a slightly earlier Tuesday. Um, in part, I was wondering, does that help us? Because if that is the case, then actually we can then chronologically coincide Christ's sacrifice with the sacrifice of the Lamb in the temple 
under the the temple regime. Right. Is that is that an element that that sort of sways you in favor of a slightly earlier? Yeah, Tiny William's in the week. fondness for really good questions right. <laughs> <laughs> that are very challenging to answer briefly. You know, so you're pointing to the fact that the synoptic accounts and the Johannine accounts seem to diverge. Mm -hmm. They're not a contradiction, but the synoptic accounts explicitly state that the upper room is a Passover meal. Mm -hmm. John describes it as such, but never calls it a, calls it that. But in John's account, there in John 18 and 19, it seems as though the Passover events are actually subsequent to mm -hmm. the Last Supper, which I think is true. And so I kind of riff from Pope Benedict, who on Holy Thursday back in 2006 pointed to the, the scholarship of Professor Gilbert and others, who from the Dead Sea Scrolls recognized that in the first century, there was a raging debate between the devout Jews known as Essenes who followed the solar calendar of the Mosaic Torah and the lunar calendar of the corrupt Sadducees and the Pharisees who had adapted that from the Babylonians when they had come back from captivity. Mm -hmm. Well, then God writes with, you know, straight with crooked lines because what you have in the early church, the Didascalia Apostolorum, St. Victorinus of Patau, you know, is a, is a synoptic chronology that I think is, is quite accurate. You know, I'm all in favor of keeping Holy Thursday, <laughs> but I do think that the events that we associate with Tuesday, with Thursday probably happened on Tuesday night, mm -hmm. which was, which looks to have been the Passover according to the strict Torah solar calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Mary anointed Jesus at Bethany two days before the Passover. John says six days before the Passover. Oh. Well, which is it? It's both. Yeah. Because what John is describing is the lunar Passover that was sort of adapted corruptly by the, mm -hmm. the priests. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, suddenly we now have enough time for five or six trials because we have Annas, Caiaphas, back to Annas, then Pilate to Herod and back to Pilate. And, you know, how do you squeeze six trials into one night, especially when the trials have to begin around 2 a.m.? Now, everybody could have pulled an all-nighter, including the mobs and the Sanhedrin, but, you know, these patristic accounts describe the Jewish trials as occurring on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and then once they realize they can't crucify him for blasphemy, they hand him over to Pilate, yeah. and then say he's trying to be a king. If you're a friend of Caesar, you can't let that happen. And so Pilate hands him to Herod, who hands him back to Pilate, and the Roman trials are Thursday, and the verdict and the sentence of death is Good Friday. And this just seems so much more plausible than trying to do bam, bang, bang, you know, all mm -hmm. of the trials from mm -hmm. 2 a.m. until roughly mm -hmm. 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And so in that chapter, I show how in God's merciful providence, the Dead Sea Scrolls show us something that the rabbis were well aware of for the next 900 years, and that is, is it a lunar or is it a solar? Mm -hmm. Well, in God's providence, it was both, yeah. and it's uh, fulfilled that way. And that opens up the possibility that, that the Last Supper really is the Passover, and yet Jesus, as the new lamb, really is slaughtered at the moment That's right. where the lambs are slaughtered. Otherwise, you can't, you can't do that. That's a kind of divine configuration. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's sort of like in John 11 when Caiaphas, being high priest that year, prophesied inadvertently. Well, how? Well, it's a cynical quip from a co-conspirator. It's better for one man to die to spare the nation. You know, so here is the, the quintessentially corrupt high priest giving us what is ironically and divinely a prophecy. Yeah. And so here is a corrupt institution that nevertheless yields the most exquisite fulfillment of God's purpose and plan. And I think that runs throughout John's account mm -hmm. that sort of overlaps with complementarity and not contradiction right. with the synoptic narratives and a wonderful symphony uh, that is fourfold. How does uh, all of this, how does especially this understanding of the connection of the sacrifice with the Last Supper, especially as uh, we're in Lent and we're heading towards Holy Week, um, what is the implication for us? as Catholics. You mentioned that many yeah. of your Protestant brothers and sisters would be horrified to think this was a sacrifice. And I'm, I'm actually curious to somebody that wasn't raised Protestant, why would they be so upset by this? Well, you know, I, it, it, it varies from Protestant to Protestant, but sure. I mean, the idea of a sacrifice, you know, a sacrifice is once for all, over and done, it's in the past. Mm. That's what Hebrews means by once for all. But if in fact, once for all in Hebrews is talking about what our high priest in heaven is doing. It's not once and for all in the sense of terminated. It's once for all in the sense of perpetuated. Mm -hmm. You don't repeat the sacrifice, but you don't repeat anything if it's never ending. Mm 
And if Christ's high priestly offering is everlasting in heaven, then of course it's not repetitive, it's everlasting, it's continuous. It's what we call a perpetual offering. But I think the other part of the question about Lent, I think is more significant, and that is, this is a penitential season. And ironically, or providentially, the book came out on Ash Wednesday, you know. And so in the period of Lent, we have to recognize that Jesus has transformed suffering into sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Pain has become the passion of divine love. He doesn't just bear a cross for us, he bestows crosses on us. But before he does, he gives us the cup of blessing over and over again in every Mass. It's the third cup that he consecrates, that our priests consecrate, yeah. because he knows that there's going to be a Gethsemane for us, mm -hmm. many of them. And he also knows that there's going to be an hour of death. So that as he drank the fourth cup at the hour of death, transforming death into prayer, mm -hmm. liturgy, sacrifice, the loss of life becomes the gift of life, not just for us, but he empowers us through the Eucharist to make our life a gift of love in return to him for his gift of life to My us. God. And that reciprocity to me is the beauty that Jesus alone died without losing his life. He made his life a gift of love and he empowers us to do that in the Eucharist, then the Garden of Gethsemane, then when we carry our cross to our Calvary, when we breathe our last like I saw my mother and my father do, you suddenly see what Jesus has done. He's transformed death into yeah. the perfect sacrifice of love. So the cry from the cross, you know, consumatum est, it is finished, consummated. That, I mean, at the mystical level, that means all of reality, the whole broken human condition has been gathered up by Jesus and offered, you know, bestowed, returned yes. to the Father. This is the all-pure oblation. What is it? What is finished? The yeah. Passover, the New Covenant, because we're not coming out of Egypt into Canaan. Yeah. We're coming out of mortality right. into the glory of God in heaven. Yeah. So the death becomes the ultimate passage to a promised land that makes Canaan look like Egyptian bondage in comparison. Right. So we're able to say to death, thou shalt die. That's right. Life is the last word. And we can say with Jesus, it is finished. Right. My Passover is complete. I am now ready to enter into the promised land of heaven. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, when we come back, our panel and guest will have their final thoughts on today's topic. So please stay with us. When Jesus said, it is consummated, after drinking the wine, what was the it referring to? The Passover, which he had begun in the upper room with his disciples while instituting the Eucharist, which he had temporarily suspended, he now completes and consummates by drinking the wine that would correspond to the fourth cup of consummation. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, would you start us off with some you know, of your thoughts? Uh, I'm a, a great welter of, uh, of images and impressions that I'll try and uh, make some sense of. But the thing that really struck me, Scott, about your book, and it's in all of your books, uh, this marvelous autobiographical strain. I mean, it's just marvelously confessional. Uh, and near the end of the book, you recount your first Mass uh, as a Catholic. And just before uh, uh, the, uh, the communion, uh, there's the consecration. And you are literally salivating uh, and weeping at the prospect of receiving Jesus uh, for the very first time. Would that all Catholics could uh, experience that kind of uh, thrill, that anticipatory joy. I mean, that's pretty amazing because most Catholics, when they repair uh, to the altar rail, are utterly indifferent, casual, and perhaps even disbelieving. It just doesn't 
amount to a hill of beans. But for you, this was life-giving, life-changing. And, and it struck me that Christianity is an event we experience, we encounter, uh, when we taste and see and feel and touch the living God. And this is exactly what your whole life has been a preparation for, communion with the living God, especially in the Eucharist. And, and I, I, re, you know, I, I can't help but think of that scene in John's Gospel where it all begins. Andrew and John have attached themselves to John the Baptist, and they're listening to this guy. And there is somebody in the crowd who breaks off, wanders away, and John suddenly espies him and announces, there goes the Lamb of God. And instinctively, John and Andrew break away, and they follow this mystery man who notices uh, their approach and turns and asks them, what are you looking for? What do you desire? What do you want? And, and they say, where do you live? And in a very gentle sort of way, he says, come and see. Yeah. And I ask myself, where does he live now? He lives in the Eucharist. I mean, that's the fourth cup. Yeah. Uh, and his consummation of time and history makes possible this ongoing intimacy with Jesus, which is precisely Eucharistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've nailed it. Uh, and it's a beautiful book. Yeah. yeah, beautiful testimony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many things to pick from, but 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 one thing that really struck me was the sort of you might say sort of the the wisdom of the divine storekeeper who brings out of his store both old mm -hmm. and new. Because the way you explain the Passover, there's the the old elements or the Last Supper rather. There's the old elements of you know, it's in Jerusalem, it's at night, and all those other elements which we can see. Oh yeah, this is the Passover. And then there's something startlingly new. There isn't the lamb, uh, the, the animal of the lamb, there is a different lamb which is present and the fourth cup isn't drunk there, it's drunk somewhere else. And something else from the, the things you wrote sort of struck me was, the other difference of course is that um, they didn't drink the blood of the lamb that was right. sacrificed, they poured it out. Uh, and that's a difference there as well because the blood that they poured out was offered to God, and as far as I understand from the book in Leviticus uh, se um, chapter 17, it's in part because the blood was, was belonging only to God. It was the life, and that belongs to God and is only given to God in worship. And look what we have in the new Passover, uh, in the Mass. Certainly, the blood which is poured out is offered to God, yeah, in Him, through Him, with Him. But actually, we get to drink that blood. Because that which in the Old Covenant was His and His alone, in the New Covenant, he shares with us. Beautiful. And yeah. that struck me as that is somehow essentially the difference between the old and the new. The, the intimacy that was yearned for in the old, something which is almost exclusively God's, is given to us right. in the new. Yeah, that's really the consummation of, a, of, of an eternal longing of, of mankind. Right. I mean, in my years of Bible study, I have come to see the covenant as central, the old covenant and the new and how they're not opposed, they're harmonized, but they're not the same. So in the Old Covenant, you have a human family that shares flesh and blood, but not until the divine enters into the human family do we really have flesh and blood to eat and drink that binds us, not just horizontally, as a family. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. We're the, we're the, we're the, f the flock, you know, but, but when, the, when the shepherd becomes the Lamb of God, suddenly covenant kinship is not merely human, but it is divine. And the, the flesh and the blood that we eat and drink is now, as you say, a communion in the blood of Christ. And Saul, as a Pharisee, would have been familiar with koinonia. Habura is the Hebrew term that is at the center of the Pharisee's faith. But it's a horizontal communion. Nowhere would you ever find a Pharisee applying it vertically to claim that we have communion with God? No, he's the source of communion among us. But to claim that we enter into this kinship with God borders on blasphemy. And yet now it is exactly the opening line of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. We share the flesh and blood of his son. And he fathers this family more than just pasturing a flock. And the new fulfills the old like new wine bursts old skins, you know. And so there really is a nice sense in which you're referring to the end of Matthew 13 where you take out of the old and the new, you know. 
And there is similarity, but there's also dissimilarity. And I think the greatest dissimilarity is precisely what this Lent is all about. And that is suffering in the New Testament becomes sacrificial. Mm -hmm. Not just by Jesus as a substitute, but as a representative. Not just by our observation, but by our participation. So that when we continually draw from the, the Eucharist, whether we're receiving from the chalice or not, we are continually receiving the third cup. But it's always preparation for the fourth cup. You know, it's preparation for Gethsemanes of various sorts. But I, 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 I excised from the last chapter an account of my own near-death experience back in 2012, when around 4.45 a.m. I was at Weirton Medical School, Weirton Medical Hospital, and I, I almost died. And I had last rites from Father Ray, a rosary with Kimberly. But all of a sudden, this truth came home to me. And facing death, I felt like our Lord and Our Lady were there taking away my fear. Like, I'm not about to lose my life. I don't want to die, but if it's God's will, I get to pay you back the smallest pittance of what you poured into my soul. And fortunately for Kimberly and the family and for me, I was spared. The surgeon did an amazing job and had very little time to cut quick and deep and long. But uh, I look back on that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in another book. <laughs> <laughs> But it really was the transformative moment for me to realize this is more than theory, this is practice. Yeah. This is more than observation, this is participation. This is what we mean by offer it up, redemptive suffering, whatever else we mean. Right, and it's not just in a symbolic way, it's yeah. in a real way that we get to participate in. Hangnails um, are holy. <laughs> exactly, amen, amen. Well, thank you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, today's handout is an audio recording of a talk on the fourth cup given by Dr. Scott Hahn. And you can listen to that at faithandreason.com. You know, my brief thought on this is I, uh, yeah, I got to hear this as a student of yours 20 years ago <laughs> and was so blessed by it. Um, just connecting everything together, that was what was great. You know, I would say as a, as a Catholic at the time, I knew there was a Holy Thursday liturgy, I knew there was a Good Friday, I knew there was an Easter Sunday. I tried to go to all three, right. depending on what was going on that day. But seeing the through line of how what Jesus was doing in the Last Supper, the sacrifice of the cross, and of course the glory of the resurrection. And then as I paid more closely attention to the liturgy itself, how um, you know Holy Thursday begins a liturgy but doesn't finish it. Right. It continues through Good Friday. We don't, you know, we make the sign of the cross in the beginning of Holy Thursday. We don't do it again until the closing of the Easter vigil. It's the same celebration wow. that we are all invited to to be a part of. So thank you for watching the show. May God bless your Holy Week, and we look forward to seeing you soon. To listen to or to download a free audio recording by Dr. Scott Hahn on The Fourth Cup, go to faithandreason.com. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.